valuable time, a valuable time yesterday and got some good feedback from the judges and that you're enjoying IBEC overall. My name is Jim Arnold and I have been with IBEC for 18 years now and I'm a former professor in an MBA program at University of St. Thomas here in Minneapolis. And before, before the, then I actually brought teams and, and advised teams for IBEC. And having done that, I know what you've all gone through in order to get here. I know the amount of work that you have put into it. And, and we, we thank you for that. And thank you for all that you are bringing us here. That's certainly part of IBEC is that we get to hear from a lot of really smart students on a lot of different topics that, that we don't necessarily know uh, information about. So we learn from you just, to, just uh, as much. Hello. I Hello, hello, Mary. We have uh, I have a couple of colleagues that are assisting. Hi, how are you, today. Mary? Are you with us? Okay. Let Mary sit down here. Yeah. Go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna multi ask. I'm multitasking here. Okay, Mary, I'm gonna ask you to single task for just a minute here because I'd like you to introduce yourself. Okay, I can't see anybody else on my screen. I can just see you. Is there anyone else here? Yeah, we're all here. Les, okay, any, cool. anyone, any idea why he can't see the rest of us? I'm looking. Um, I'm on my mobile. It might be a mobile phone issue. Uh, that, he, he, he appears to have a good connection on my end. Um, That's okay. No problem. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm not sure who I'm talking to here, but uh, my name is Murray Granger. I've had the pleasure of being uh, on the IBEC judging group now for a good few years. Um, what else do you want to know? I'm in Spain. Uh, it's Friday afternoon. I'm going to take this outside in the sunshine on my mobile. And uh, I'm a lawyer. I'm the country manager for Spain and Portugal for EQS Group which is the market leading provider for digital compliance solutions. Okay. Happy to answer any questions you may have, but hopefully that's that's sufficient for present purposes. Great, great, thank you. And I do have another person that, that uh, is assisting today who will be arriving a little bit later. Now that we've done that, I'm gonna ask each of, each of our speakers, could you each go through, tell us where you're from and uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, area of study or anything else you'd like us to know. But Let, let's start with, uh, let's see, we have some Montgomery folks here. Let's start with our Montgomery folks. Sure, yeah, I'll go first. My name is Madeline and we're representing Montgomery College um, and we're from Maryland and we're both part of a business program called the Macklin Business Institute at Montgomery College and we're excited to present today. Excellent, welcome. My name is Alicia. I'm a freshman and I just started. So that's my first uh, IBEC competition. And that was a really exciting experience. So I'm happy to share today what we done and put our effort in today. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Felicia. And welcome to your first IBEC. We have a lot of students that come back to us uh, year after year, and we hope that you'll be, you will be one of them. Our, our uh, competitors from Holy Cross, would you introduce yourselves to us? Yes, my name is Anthony Petrosino. I'm from North Reading, Massachusetts, and I am a computer science major. And me and my partner are both freshmen, and this is our first IBEX, and we look forward to the next one being in person. Yes, and believe me, we are too. So welcome, uh, welcome to your first IBEX. We're glad you're here. And joining you today would be uh, Ilya. Yeah, my name is Ilya Kolesnikov. I'm from Jacksonville, Florida, and I'm a freshman economics major. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome. Our friends from Stetson. Yes. Uh, my name is Jackson Kabelsecki. I'm a sophomore here. This is also my first IBEC. I'm an entrepreneurship major with a minor in finance and a focus on investments. Excellent, excellent, welcome. Yep. And my name is Cole. I'm a first year student at Setson University with a major in finance, concentration investments as well, with backgrounds also in Russian studies as well as accounting. And 
while this is my first IBEG, I'm looking forward to it and hopefully many more after. Excellent. Well, we love we love to get to have the youngest ones in here because then we can count on you coming back for a number of years before you graduate. And uh, from SUNY Potsdam. Hello, my name is Macy. I'm currently a senior here at SUNY Potsdam and I am from Potsdam, New York. Okay, excellent. My name is Tanner. Um, I'm a business major. I'm a senior and I am from Hubleton, New York. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome. Um, my name is Zion and I'm, I'm from Harlem, New York, and I'm also a senior and a business major as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. I'd also like you to meet, if we can see him here in a second, uh, we do have uh, uh, another person, another colleague joining me to help out with the judging today, and that is Mr. Murray Granger, and he has already introduced himself to you today. We also have have a very, very important person, maybe the most important person in the room because they make my life so much easier. And that is our technical expert, Les Dishman. If you could tell us a little bit about yourself, Les. Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Les Dishman. Um, this is my first IBEX. Um, uh, so um, it's been interesting uh, 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 to see this all come together and hear all the presentations. I um, spent uh, 22 years in the Air Force, um, 18 or 19 of those was in the uh, Air Force intelligence community. And um, after that, I did eight or 10 years at a place called the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica. It's the um, first uh, ever think tank, they like to say. Um, I was a department manager there um, working uh, government uh, program security. Um, and then I went to Raytheon, uh, Raytheon Corporation, another defense contractor in El Segundo, California for about six or eight years. I was doing business development and program security there. Um, and then I retired on my second retirement. So now I'm looking for um, unique and inventive ways to fill my time. And that's what led me to IBEX. So happy to be here and happy to help out. Excellent. Thank you so much. You mean, you mean a lot to us. Here's the order that we are going to go in today. We're going to start with Montgomery. And then, we, then we'll be Holy Cross. And then we'll be Stetson. And then we'll be uh, SUNY Potsdam. Now, I'm going to read you a statement here. This is just as was the case yesterday. This is information that was on our website, so I'm sure you've seen it before, but we just like to have everybody start out on a level playing field by hearing the exact same instructions. For the 10-minute presentation, you have been called back by the company you gave your full presentation to for a second visit. They have asked you to speak only about the ethical aspects of the problem and to explain why your solution successfully handles any ethical issues. You will have 10 minutes. There will be no Q&A. And uh, you may not use slides or video. And also, uh, we need you to make sure that you don't read off of notes. That's considered a, a major weakness. And we'd also like you, when you speak, to look into your mic, you know, to your camera when you speak so that we can make eye contact with you. That's difficult for some people because with Zoom, we're used to thinking that we can look at somebody's window on the screen and we think that we're looking at them, but we're really not. So please be sure that you that you look into your camera as well. Now, all four teams are going to present in a row with just a couple minutes in between for for me and uh, Mary to, to take any final notes that we want to do, and then we'll bring the next team up. At the end, after all four of you have presented, we will go back and Murray will give you feedback uh, individually for not by person, but by, by team, give you any feedback on how you've done and, and the ethical issues that you may have, uh, have brought up. Do we have any questions before we start? In that case, we are going to start today with Montgomery College, and we would like to welcome you a second time to IBEC, and whenever you are ready to begin, please do so. Thank you for inviting us once again. We are happy to be here and share a little bit more about the ethical dimension of this problem, as you requested. According to the Banking on Climate Change Chaos Report of 2022, JP Morgan continued to be one of the four banks that most invest in fossil fuel companies in the United. Therefore, the 
issue here is that organization continue fin financing fossil fuel companies, including those that engage in environmental damaging, such as oil drilling and coal mining. By providing billions of dollars to fund the expansion of fossil fuel project, GP Morgan can be seen as a company that indirectly support the continued use of fossil fuel, which result in greenhouse gas emission that uh, intensify climate change. This had led to criticism in many accusing that the bank would merely be greenwashing and using their commitment as a marketing tool while continuing to practice harmful activities. So why is this an ethical dilemma? JP Morgan's commitment to a net zero emissions promise by 2050 is an ethical dilemma because it raises the question about the bank's accountability for its past and actual environmental harm, its commitment to truly addressing climate change, and its willing, willingness to prioritize environmental and social responsibility over profits. Our solution is multi-tier, where your company acts in the short and long term. In the short run, the action plan includes low lift eco-friendly behaviors, such as supporting carpooling, incentivizing the public use of transportation, and promoting environmental behavior friendly, oh, environmental friendly behaviors within your locations. This could help the bank identify areas where it needs to improve its sustainability practices and build trust with its stakeholders. By taking these steps, you can set an example for your employees and customers while reducing carbon footprint. Our long-term approach will pay off in the long run when fossil fuel companies are replaced with other types of energy. By investing in renewable energy sources, JP Morgan can reduce its carbon footprint and promote sustainable practices. This at the same time will increase the company's reputation since it can be advertised as a new environmental focus of the company, produce, um, promoting a positive image and attracting environmentally conscious customers and investors. From an ethical point of view, JP Morgan has in the past done tangible good by funding fossil fuel companies, which have provided jobs and income for people around the world, um, help supported economic growth, provided a reliable and affordable source of energy. It has improved the um, standards of living and quality of life. Um, and uh, might add the fact that many countries rely on fossil fuels to meet their energy needs, which can help ensure energy security and um, reduce the dependence on foreign sources of energy. Um, and in fact, according to the United Nations, 80% of the global population live in countries that are net importers of fossil fuels and are dependent on them. On the other hand, JP Morgan should not fund companies that harm others and the environment. The tangible harm that those companies they fund do or that they burn fossil fuel that release greenhouse gases and other pollutants that contribute to climate change. In fact, greenhouse gases have severe impact on both human and the environment, such as um, uh, air and water pollution, um, habitat destruction, and impact on our health too. In particular, indigenous and marginalized um, population are severely impacted by this case. They can lose their land and resources and are really impacted um, when regarding their health. Investing in fossil fuel companies raise important ethical uh, issue because of the negative impact that fossil fuel can have on our environment and on human, human well-being. Um, furthermore, GP Morgan's pledge and mission statement uh, prohibit such investments. So our solution allows GP Morgan to do right things and align itself with its pledge and their mission statement. So by implementing our solution, you can reduce your climate change footprint while profiting from this ethical shift. In fact, 
Even if fossil fuels still represent 80% of global energy production, cleaner sources of energy are gaining ground. About 29% of global electricity currently comes from renewable sources, showing that renewable sources are becoming important. And this percent is expected to increase moving into the future. According to the United Nations, renewable energy is actually becoming the cheapest power option in most parts of the world, and prices for renewable energy technology are dro dropping rapidly. The cost of electricity from solar power fell by actually 85% between 2010 and 2020, and the cost of onshore and offshore wind energy fell by 56% and 48% respectively. Falling prices makes renewable energy more attractive all around, benefiting low and middle income countries where most of the additional demand for new electricity comes from. A question that might cross your mind right now would be, what about all this tangible good that JP Morgan was doing through fossil fuel companies? Of course, we don't want all those people to lose their jobs and all those countries to be negatively impacted. However, by considering some additional information, you can see how our solution will still provide jobs and income and help countries. In fact, every dollar of investment in renewable creates three times more jobs than in the fossil fuel industry. According to the IEA, the International Energy Agency, the transition toward uh, net zero will, be, will lead to an overall increase in energy sector jobs while about 5 million of jobs will be lost, uh, an estimated of 14 million jobs will be created in clean energy, resulting in a net gain of 9 million jobs. Also, when looking to the 80% of the global population that lives in countries that are net importers of fossil fuel, which is about 6 billion people, we can get another perspective. In fact, the dependence of third countries makes them vulnerable to geopolitical shocks and crises. And GP Morgan, by implementing our solution, can help fight against that. Another outcome that GP Morgan will accrue by following our suggestion is that it will be, it will they will have, uh, I mean, you will have a better image and reputation as a company that follows ethical principles. In fact, our solution are based on the Global Business Standard Codex of the Harvard Business School, which outline the code of conduct and the universal guideline that corporation must follow. By implementing our solutions, JP Morgan upholds many of those principles. However, three main points are enforced by our solution. First, the reliability principle, which states that basically corporations should honor their commitment, whether they are enforced by law or not. And this principle is exemplified by our solution because we make suggestions that help JP Morgan reach their goal of, how we, of having net zero emissions by 2050. The second is the transparency principle, which states that businesses um, must be conducted in a truthful and open manner. This will help JP Morgan show that they are not greenwashing and make people actually believe their words. The last recommendation is the dignity principle, which states that the dignity of everyone should be respected. In fact, it promotes the protection of health, safety, privacy, and human rights. And um, this principle is part of our solution because we strive to help JP Morgan do less harm through their funds. In conclusion, while JP Morgan's commitment to becoming a net zero carbon emission company by 2050 is a positive step for forward addressing the climate crisis, you must ensure that your clients do not see JP Morgan's commitment merely as greenwashing or green hushing, as they say now, to avoid unintended consequences. And that, on the other hand, JP Morgan sets more ambitious goals for reducing its carbon footprint. You can become a leader in the fight against climate change by progressively changing your portfolio and focusing on creating a more sustainable future for everybody. And that's our presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that. Thank you. I'm going to take just a minute here and um, uh, Mariana, we will write down our notes a little bit and then, then we will come back to Holy Cross. <laughs>
Next up, we have Holy Cross. Now for Holy Cross, Murray and I are considered uh, as part of FLIF's board of directors. To our folks, our friends from Holy Cross, again, welcome to IBEC for the second time and you can begin when you're ready. Well, once again, FLIF board, <clears throat> thank you for inviting us back to discuss the ethical aspects of our argument. As you know, we are the Crusader Consultants. My name is Anthony Petrosino. I am a representative from Crusader Consultants. And my name is Ilya Kolesnikov, also a consultant. We appreciate you inviting us back and further would like to discuss the ethical issues facing FLIF's current state of operations. Although FLIF has the potential for massive revenue through its accessibility and ease of use, this can pose an ethical dilemma for the company when it comes to its user base. FLIF is using legal technicalities in order to avoid legal restrictions associated with running a legal traditional sports book and is thus able to reach an untapped market of underage bettors who are more susceptible to FLIF's marketing and retention tactics, in turn unethically getting kids hooked onto addictive and self-destructive behavior. Sports gambling has become a serious problem in the United States. Problem gambling impacts just 4 to 8% of adults, of youths, sorry, compared to just 1% of adults, and we believe that FLIF is contributing to these numbers. Along with being more susceptible to problem gambling, teens who gamble are more likely to use illegal drugs. This could lead to many other issues that could have detrimental long-term effects. And among all addictions, gambling is linked to the highest suicide rate. Sports gambling is still a very relevant problem as the number of 11th and 12th grade males experiencing gambling problems, such as lying about how much they lost or being unable to control their gambling, rose to 8.3% in 2022 compared to 4.2% in 2018, according to a survey of 7,500 7th through 12th graders in Wood County, Ohio. FLIF exacerbates this issue with youth and sports gambling, largely through the app, website, and marketing tactics that it uses. The website and marketing is targeted toward a younger audience through a simple, colorful, easy to use interface. Although FLIF has a complex sweepstakes system behind it, it seemingly simplifies the system in order to make it more user-friendly. This can lead to confusion when inexperienced users attempt to understand how the system works and simply believe that they are sports betting the same way they would on other sports books. The interface on the FLIF app makes it easy and simple for users to place bets with both FLIF coins and cash. Along with being easy to use, certain guidelines set forth in the FLIF's terms of service also help perpetuate gambling. One way that FLIF perpetuates gambling is that it implements a fixed interval reward system. In the system, bettors are given one FLIF cash every day for a maximum of five FLIF cash and 5,000 free coins every day with no max cap. They are also given 10 cents in FLIF cash and 1,000 FLIF coins every two hours throughout the day. This conditions users into logging into FLIF frequently where they are able to place bets indefinitely, even if they lose all their money. Because users may believe that they have this quote unquote free money to fall back on, they may bet excessively and take more risks. Since the money is given to them, they don't take any actual risk in betting the money away. This could lead to problems in the long term as users may become more impulsive and not understand the actual risks of sports betting and the amount of money they may be losing. If teens continue to bet in this manner with their own money as adults, this would surely be considered problem gambling. FLIF also forces continued gambling as it invalidates FLIF cash after 30 days of inactivity on an account. When users log into the app to keep their cash, they are encouraged to place more bets, fueling their gambling addictions. Yet another example of this perpetuated sports gambling is that the minimum withdrawal of FLIF cash is $50. This forces users to continue to gamble until they meet this requirement and can deposit their FLIF cash into their bank account at a one-to-one -one ratio. These aspects of the app harm young people's underdeveloped brains and could cause permanent damage. Perpetual gambling can lead to massive long-term losses and a diminished feeling of self-worth as shown by many studies. Clearly, gambling is a serious issue. Although discussions about the consequences of gambling are rare between parents and their children. Parents tend to focus on making sure their children are aware of many other common issues teenagers might face, such as drugs and alcohol, while they might not tend to focus on other addictive behaviors such as sports betting. This could lead to teens being roped into sports betting without any awareness for its destructiveness. For teens uneducated about the severity of sports gambling, FLIF may become their testing grounds and teens may find themselves excessively and with, 
with little, betting excessively with little risk tolerance, unaware of the fact that they are developing a gambling addiction. We suggest a variety of solutions that FLIF could provide, which help prevent gambling addiction for these younger users. We suggest that FLIF provide easy access to sports gambling addiction education. This will help users develop responsible betting techniques instead of spiraling out of control. Many other sports books currently do this, such as DraftKings. By providing information and assistance to users, FLIF demonstrates its commitment to its community. Another feature of FLIF we touched upon is that FLIF has taken little security measures in order to prevent underage users from accessing its software and becoming addicted. FLIF does not check for legal identification until the user attempts to make a purchase or withdrawal of FLIF coins or FLIF cash. When creating a new account, a user only needs a username, a password, email address, and phone number, and they only have to check off a box saying that they're 18 and up. This lack of security measures allows underage users to thrive on this application as they can simply check off the box and move on regardless of their age. Our first solution would help FLIF take steps in order to combat any gambling addiction that may occur through the use of FLIF. We suggest that FLIF could add a feature that limits the amount that can be wagered during certain periods of the day or certain periods of time, for example, daily, weekly, or monthly total wager limits. If the limit is permanent on an account, it can prevent it can prevent users from betting excessively. And it, many official sports books currently implement such a process as it has been proven to not be, lead to a drastic loss in profits. And it can help FLIF demonstrate its commitment to users while helping them in the long term prevent their gambling addictions. Our second solution is to help prevent identity fraud on the app, as many young users may use the app who are even younger than the age of 18. Flif, we suggest that FLIF could use a self-certified identification system or a SCID system to confirm identification upon making an account instead of only requiring users to check off a box. This system is already used by other sports books and involves the user submitting a picture of them holding their government ID next to their face, allowing uh, the company to make sure that the user really is the person on the ID. We further suggest that the SCID system could be developed a step further in order to take a user's ID upon every login to the app and maybe scan their face as you do when you log into your phone. Although this may be more costly, come with privacy concerns and take more time to develop. Since members of the teen age demographic typically have less money to spend, preventing underage users from gaining access to the app should not have a large negative impact on profits and may even have a positive impact on profits. If you choose to implement the suggestions that we have presented, FLIF's users will be safe from the possible dangers associated with underage sports betting, and FLIF as a company would benefit from earning the trust of, of potential customers through the use and impl implementation of ethical business practices. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate that, Holy Cross. Next up, we have. Stetson, and uh, I am, let's see, I am Shannon Jones, and I'm in the Senior Executive Staff All-in-One. That's how talented I am. I can be everything all at once, and, and of course, Mary is as well. So, uh, folks from Stetson, if you are ready, welcome to IBEC again, and your second competition, and you can begin whenever you're ready. Yes. So, good morning. My name is Jackson, and this is Cole. And we have immense gratitude and a deep sense of responsibility for having been invited back to consult on this ethical issue that is very complex. Romance in the workplace is a topic that premates the very core value of all professional lives and demands careful consideration. It is also a normal thing, and is human nature every company has had to deal with. And once again, thank you for the invite back. Your trust and faith at Fruitland Enterprise shows that our ex expertise is not only humbling, but uh, reaffirms our commitment to engage in a meaningful and constructive dialogue. As we dive into the ethical challenges surrounding the issue of work 
uh, romance in the workplace, it is essential to recognize that while these relationships may seem innocent, they have far-reaching consequences that affect the well-being and productivity of the entire organization. Jackson will now discuss how uh, romance in the workplace became an issue in the first place. Yes, romance in the workplace becomes an ethical issue when it leads to conflict of interest, favoritism, power imbalances, and potential compromising fairness. Integrity, also the appearance of the conflict of interest is just as important. Additionally, undressed or poorly managed workplace relationships can create an uncomfortable work environment, affecting the well-being of the rights of all employees. The current policy that Enterprise has is personal relationships between managers and team members that report to them are prohibited. With this, it is very flawed and vague and narrow scoped. The lack of a clear definition for personal relationships can confuse the employees and the possibilities of discriminatory practices. By only addressing relationships between managers, direct reports, and the policy overlooks other workplace relationships that may cause conflicts of interest or power imbalances. By having more comprehensive, clear, and fair policy is needed to effectively address workplace relationships, ensuring an ethical and supportive environment for all employees. Romance in the workplace can be a sensitive issue for any organization, especially for Fruitland Enterprise. The corporation has 37,000 employees. It is crucial to address this topic in a manner that promotes professionalism, fairness, and respect while minimizing potential and negative impacts on the work environment. And here are some statistics that ties in why it's an ethical problem. And the first one being that 58% of employees have engaged in romantic relationships with a coworker at some point in their career. So by having this, we all know that more than half of people do this. It is just human nature, it's a reality. Everyone has to accept it. You can't just get rid of something like this because it's just human nature, it's reality. Another important statistic is that 41% of the people at the same time do not know what their own company's policy is about workplace relationships. By having this lack of awareness, it can lead to a lot of confusion and misunderstandings in the workplace. And the final statistic shows that 72% of employees who have participated in workplace romance have a willingness and has expressed that they want to do this again. So have this all being said, Man's relationships may create a hostile or an uncomfortable environment, infringing on the rights and well-being of all employees. Cole will further discuss the power dynamics, conflicts of interest, favoritism, and how stakeholders are all affected with romance in the workplace. Yeah, now to get into the nitty-gritty of the ethical issues themselves of uh, workplace romance. Firstly, power dynamics, when two people enter into a relationship in the workplace, it can create a situation where one person has more power and influence over the other, specifically in regard to a management and subordinate relationship. This is why in our policy, we strongly discourage these types of relationships, but if they were to occur, in which they inevitably will in the real world, um, we will change ultimately who that employee reports to so that they no longer are under the supervision of their romantic partner. In regard to favoritism, when two people are in a romantic situation together, there can be a tendency for them to show each other favoritism and provide special treatment. This ultimately affects all other stakeholders and can be seen especially by other employees as unfair and create a resentment and distrust. This is very similar in nature to the general idea of a conflict of interest or the appearance of such, which is really just as harmful as there being one in the first place. This is an example, or this is an example of why we require uh, employees to report to new superiors if they are in such a relationship. Um, in the event that these things are to happen, it affects not only managers and employees, but all stakeholders as a whole. Um, as a workplace that is made up of people, romance inherently affects everyone around it. So to be considerate of others, our policy has made uh, sure to be fair to everyone. And we should say that it is as human as the stakeholders themselves. Jackson will now give some closing remarks. 
Yes. So we appreciate the opportunity to consult with Fruitland Enterprise on this critical ethical issue of workplace romance. We are committed to working with your organization to implement a comprehensive, clear, and fair policy that promotes professionalism, fairness, and respect while minimizing potential and negative impacts on the work environment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, our friends from Stetson. And just give us a couple of minutes here. And finally, we have SUNY New York in Potsdam. And the audience that you are speaking to today, this is where Murray and I are. We are from the Board of Education. So when you are ready, welcome again to IBEC, and you can begin whenever you're ready. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the school board. Um, before beginning, we just wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you for calling us back to discuss our ethical issue. My name is Zion Smalls, and I'm the journalist here at Leaders to Be. And today I am accompanied by our team manager, Macy, as well as our researcher, um, Tanner. Today we will be discussing the fact that um, the, the ethical issue that many students are not only being pressured to go to college, but many students are also being taught the idea that college is the only option and solution to achieve economic success. Throughout the many years, although the value of a degree has decreased, it seems that even with college being the major opportunity back then and still now, with this, with this idea that um, with the value of the uh, with the value of a degree decreasing over the years, it seems that the only thing that has not changed is the pressure to go to college. Many students have been growing up, and um, in many different situations, these students are being taught that without college, they do not have any chance of success. Also, for the students that do not go to college or maybe take a time off to go to college, they are often scrutinized and they are viewed as, they are frowned upon or viewed as selling themselves short. When it comes to, um, when it comes to pressuring students to go to college, some of the key stakeholders in this situation would have to be first the school board in itself. Although the school board is not 100% responsible for um, the pressure to go to college, for, for many students K through 12, it is seen that many students are taught in their very own school that they should go to college and that college is the only option. Me, myself, personally, from personal experience, in my school, I was taught that we were, we were supposed to work hard, go to college, and change the world. Although we weren't given the building blocks on how to achieve this, one thing that we were taught for sure was that we had to go to college. Another group that plays a very strong role in this would have to be the parents. The parents once walked, well, the parents once walked in the footsteps of the students. So a lot of the beliefs and ideals that this parents share with their students are stuff that they learned with the school board themselves when they were younger. And a lot of times in the very own home with these young students, they are taught that they have to go to college. And for these students that don't go to college, they're um, viewed as selling themselves short. Of course, one of the main stakeholders will also have to be the students. These students are the ones that are actually being pressured and growing up, these students will become the new key society members in society. So these students will grow up sharing the same ideals that they learned in college as well. Now we pass it to Macy to discuss the main idea. Jumping right into the main main issue, as we have discussed before, before is that the school board um, does force and create pressure for students to go to a college, giving them the incentive that this is the only option. We hear the leaders to be feel so confidently and so urgently over this issue as we daily even see our peers and our own mentors struggle from side effects of this issue daily. Currently, mental health is an arising issue in today's society, and when pressuring students to go to college, given on top of this, it can sometimes end catastrophically. We here again want to remind those 
that success is built within all and not through a college diploma. Moving on to another, another ethical issue that goes in hand with, with this is that students are not getting adequate information throughout their high school years. When we say this, we are implying that teachers, guidance counselors, and even parents are steering students into one direction and that direction is college, not giving them any other opportunities or educated education. Moving on to the second issue is that in our society as a whole, our culture pushes starting a degree at 18. Based off extensive research, we have concluded that at the age of 18, a brain is not fully developed and matureness is yet to peak. And moving on to another ethical issue is that gap years are extremely frowned upon within our society. When one may take a gap year, they are they may be giving off the incentive that they are coming off lazy, unmotivated, undriven, and just want to get out of school. On top of 12 years of high school, many students um, need a break to find themselves, their true life incentives and meanings. And moving on to Tanner, he will be discussing our three options. So there are many options that could be possible ways to resolve or even help the ethical issue of students being pressured to go to college. And the first um, option would be for teachers or schools to remind students that they don't need to go to college in order to be successful. Nowadays, the internet is being used for people to learn for free and all the options are out there for students to take. You, if they chose that college was not the right path for themselves. Again, we're not influencing or trying to push students to not go to college, but we're just offering other options, letting the school board know that they need to show students that there's other options nowadays that they can push students towards or just give options to students. When students come to make the decision on if they were to go to college or choose a career path, they need to be given options and facts in order to make the ethical and correct decision in their eyes. And the second recommendation that we would like to discuss for option would be for teachers to recommend to students to take a leap year. Uh, a leap year would be very great and the aspect of the point of relieving pressure and giving the students the enough time to choose what career path that they would like to go down. And the last recommendation that we would like to implement is the creation and funding of a program that would allow young students to learn and practice profitable information and knowledge about different career paths outside of college or outside of high school that over the years students and teachers thought of going to college. So in our recommendation, the creation and funding of a curriculum for young students to learn and pra practice profitable options outside of college, we believe is a great option for students and teachers overall. To introduce a new perspective to the young mind that hasn't been implemented before, there's different ways in which it has been subsequently aligned with other programs such as here in New York State, there's a BOCES program, which is along the same aspects of education and learning of students in different trade schools. So it's trades, but um, we were to broaden the aspect of not only just learning the aspect of behind different um, careers. So. A lot of times students believe that college is the only option. And this belief is partially due to the fact that these students haven't really been 
pushed in any other way. However, if students were to learn at, at a young age that there are other options, this would allow students to make their own choices rather than believe that college is the only option and without college that they would ultimately fail. College can play also a negative toll on the students financially and mentally, yet students are unaware of this or feel as if this is just a way, this is just something that'll just roll off and it'll work itself out. But consequently, it does not, and many students tend to drop out because of financials or mental illness. So we believe this is a major problem as college, is, college doesn't ensure success, it's only given an opportunity. So if schools were to teach and fund curriculums and clubs that taught other options of success, students would be aware of other opportunities that could be just as life-changing as college. And college isn't for everyone. And we just would really like to push to the school board that to tell students that going to college, not going to college is okay. And there's people that go to college and that don't. And there's different ways of success. And now I'm going to introduce Sion into talking about our ramifications. Yes. <clears throat> yes, the popular narrative that college is the only choice is one that cannot be changed in one day. However, with the impl implementation of our recommendation, it is possible that many positive ramifications can be made. Although we are not telling students to not go to college as we are well aware that college is a major opportunity, um, one thing that is most likely to happen when students are become more aware of other pathways and different options is that less students will go to college inevitably because with um, more options to, to find success, it's only expected that students would be less likely to want to go to college. Now, another positive ramification is the fact that um, not th without the pressures of going to college, it is very possible that many students will not have to worry about the um, mental health issues that come with college. A lot of students suffer from depression, anxiety, and more due to the many different things that go on in college, such as maybe financial debt. Now, although we're not assuring that a different pathway won't take away and cause just as much stress as college, but college has caused many different um, heartaches for young students. It's said that 1,100 students commit suicide annually in college. And it's just to say that with less pressure and um, more options of achieving success, we can say that less students will most likely suffer from mental health issues. Another major issue that um, could be handled is that the, there will be a, a most likely decrease in the overall pressures of young students. This is because with young students from K through 12 learning that college is the only option, um, giving these students um, different teachings and different options going forward and teaching them that um, there are different options growing up, these students that maybe don't wanna go to college or wanna achieve a different, different option will most likely feel more relaxed moving forward knowing that they can achieve success from somewhere else. As said before, the value of a degree, uh, the value of a degree has, um, decreased drastically. College is still a major opportunity. However, we wanna bring choices back to the young students. Success economically can be achieved in many different ways. And we really just want students to know that growing up so that a student can make their choice and encourage their future generations to make that choice as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to you. Let me just take a couple minutes for Murray and I to jot down some notes here, and then Murray will come back with some feedback for each of you. Murray, are you ready to give some feedback to each team? Good to go. 
All right, go ahead. Okay, I'm not quite sure how long you want uh, me to speak for. Just shall I be brief? Just uh, tell you what. Just be just you be you, and I'll tell you later. <laughs> uh, okay, that's cool. So, um, well done to all of the teams. Um, I think it was a very interesting exercise as a. I think it was meant to be ten minutes, um, sort of verbal presentation, uh, bearing in mind that although. The scenario was you were called back for the second presentation. Uh, I hadn't heard anything about the first presentation, so I was hearing this for the first time. Uh, that raised a few challenges. Um, I think in general, um, there was a slight feeling on some of the presentations that you were giving a 10 minute version of a much longer presentation. And you slightly fell into the trap in some cases that you tried to shoehorn in too much information. Less is more in these kinds of things. Um, clarity is extremely important. So speaking slowly, less information, being clear on your main messages, asking yourselves what you want your audience to take away from these 10 minutes and remember, uh, would probably be helpful as part of your preparation. But let me go now to some specific uh, comments on, uh, let me start, start with the first one. Um, so this one was about JP Morgan, um, which is a bank, not a company. You really confused me by talking con continually about the company because I thought you were talking about companies which borrow money from JP Morgan. What I think you were talking about, again, if I understood correctly, was JP Morgan the bank. So it's not a company in that sense. Um, there was a lot of information in this 10 minute presentation. Um, you, you came across as very um, on top of your material. You seemed very professional, but it was confusing. Um, I think you stated fairly early on in minute two or three, what the three points of your solution were. I proceeded to forget those and I spent the rest of the presentation wondering what the specific proposed solution was and whilst i heard lots of statistics because you know it sounded as though you were trying to sell me on uh climate change as though i'm some climate change denier well i don't need to hear that i think on the basis that you've got 10 minutes and you're here to present to me your solution there should have been more emphasis on what is your solution and what value does that have for me as an organization I think climate change is obvious to everybody. Um, so I think it could have been more specific, uh, a bit more focused, and this would be a good example where less, in my opinion, would have been more. Shall I pause there or shall I go on to the second team? Yeah, I'll go on to the second, Marie. Okay, cool. So second team, bit different. Um, remember this is, this is IBEX, so this is the International Business Ethics Case Competition. Uh, I didn't see any hint of any international awareness. Uh, you were talking about something called FLIF, maybe? I have no clue what that is, okay? I know I don't sit in North America. Maybe it's obvious to anybody who's in the US, but FLIF itself is a weird name. So, and I know you didn't have any visuals, so you couldn't show me a logo or anything. That's fine. But I think a bit of time to just explain this company is called FLIF this is what they do, et cetera, would have been good at the beginning because I was a bit lost. Um, again, in terms of your solutions, um, it could have been more clear because there was a lot of information mixed in there. So again, I think this was an example of where your longer presentation was sort of squashed into 10 minutes. Um, whereas you could have taken a slightly different approach for 10 minutes maximum. Imagine if you finished early, um, you know, not giving quite so much information or reformatting um, to make the overall impression clearer uh, for what exactly you were proposing, because I got a little bit lost on that one. Um, the third one, in terms of this wonderful title of romance in the workplace which seems extremely quaint um, and there was a, la a laugh out loud moment I don't think you realized where you were trying to talk about unaddressed workplace relationships and what I heard was undressed workplace relationships <laughs> so I had visions of these romantic relationships taking place um, 
against the photocopying machine. Um, so this is really cultural, this topic. And again, so in the in IBEC, I think you had a big opportunity here to be much more international, because what I heard was a very sort of North American puritanical perspective on this, that these sort of things are necessarily bad. You said yourself, 58% of people have had some kind of workplace romance. There would have been a great opportunity here to have a slightly humorous approach to this. Just imagine that 58% of the people you're talking to in this presentation themselves have had or are having some kind of um, workplace sex. So, I mean, by coming along and presenting this as a big problem and that the reporting lines need to be changed and action has to be taken, you do risk alienating your audience. Um, what I liked very much about this, this, this uh, presentation was there was a good call to action at the end. So there was a clear request at the end, please work with us. Um, where I would have been more likely to buy from you is if you had told me the success that you'd had in other organizations and maybe told me some of the good things about workplace relationships. Uh, in Europe, they are extremely common. So don't try and legislate to abolish them and ban them. How can you work around? How can you trust your people? But uh, um, I think you know, overall your call to action was very clear. I think that was a, a good presentation um, on a delicate topic, which is very real. If I come now to the fourth presentation, um, I think this benefited enormously from the three of you sitting together. So I, uh, I think I'm right in saying that all of the other presenters in the other teams uh, didn't, didn't physically sit together. Um, I would ask why not? There may be a perfectly legitimate explanation that you're on different campuses or something, but um, the benefit of the three of you coming together uh, for this session made you look and feel like a team. It made you feel connected. It helped you a lot. Um, I liked also that um, I think that the, the first presenter, and I think who was also, I think the final presenter was very good and very convincing. Frankly, uh, he could have sold me just about anything. So that was, that was really good uh, because this is a sales and marketing pitch. I know it's got to have the, the content along the lines required by the competition, but you're selling yourselves. You have one chance to make a first impression. You only have 10 minutes here. Um, you said something about, um, you know, the value of a degree has diminished. And what was really good in this format for 10 minutes is you didn't need to give me statistics to convince me of that. Uh, if you had started quoting statistics about, you know, the average uh, graduate salary between 1975 and 2023, you would have wasted time on something that was kind of taken for granted for the purpose of this 10 minute presentation. So that was really well focused because you moved on to the argumentation. I think it was very clear. Um, towards the end, you came up with an absolutely powerful statistic, if it's correct, which I hope to God it's not, that there are 1,100 suicides every year in, in, in universities and colleges. Uh, wow, that's just mind boggling. Uh, and beggars belief that action is not being taken. So I think you connected really well. You hit on a really, relevant valid issue that's a continuing challenge and you, you you highlighted the need so um well done very good thank you thank you murray i will add a few things i will preface this by saying that i actually taught presentation skills for a number of years and so some of the feedback i'm going to give you comes from that and my teaching tends to be based upon research out there there was a meta study that was done a few years back, a meta study meaning a study of studies, pulling, pulling in uh, all kinds of different studies, putting them together, the data together and analyzing it, tends to increase validity and reliability. Now, the, the idea behind it was, what are the top 10 things that turn off an audience? And then I, the second, I wanna tell you about a different study that says, what, what does it turn on to an audience? The number one thing that is a turnoff to the audience, monotone voice. This has been shown over and over as being a real problem. So what am I saying here? If you are being too serious, your, your words tend to come out very stilted and very much along a singular line, and you don't necessarily sound uh, interested in your own topic. I can promise you that your audience will never be more interested in your topic than you are and so you need to really bring them their interest level up and part of that is by the method in which you deliver the monotone voice is 
is definitely a problem. Number two, number two is reading. And either reading directly off of a script or sounding like you wrote a script and you are and you are reading from it. Adults, as children, we loved to be read to. As adults, we hate to be read to. It's just a natural phenomenon. And so you really need to get away from any kind of reading. I once took a took a, an MBA team to to uh, the National Black MBA competition, which is hosted by uh, Chrysler. And it's all Chrysler executives that that um, do the judging. And one of the pieces that they a feedback that they gave after bringing all the teams together was if you ever walk into an executive meeting at Chrysler, if you have notes, if you're reading anything, you will be dead in the water. Your whatever your proposal is, is not going to be accepted because we don't believe that you're enough behind it. And so reading, reading a presentation, that's why we put so much emphasis on that and sounding like it, which basically is rewriting your presentation and memorizing it. Same sort of thing. Different study. The flip side, what is the number one thing that is a turn on to audiences? That is enthusiasm. Matter of fact, number two and number three are so far below it that enthusiasm really stands there on its own. And so again, like I mentioned before, you thought sounding enthusiastic about your topic tells your audience that they should be as well. So always try and bring yourself into your presenting and, 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 and realize that we're talking human beings here. This is not a broadcast of information. This is a sharing of communication between individuals. Let me go back to, to uh, the beginning here. Montgomery. Second. Montgomery, I thought this was a very interesting topic and certainly one that's that is very pertinent today. And the idea that that you chose JP Morgan is it, it's a different take on things. And, and I, I really appreciated that. Some of the ethical arguments in this idea uh, that you were uh, furthering tend to be a little more simplistic. And I think you brought together some really interesting things that people may not have considered. In terms of, of how you started with, with talking about things that, that you, your employees can do, the carbon footprint, the mass transit, whatever, whatever. I, I thought that was probably not the best way to start because that's kind of yada, yada, yada. That's what everyone thinks about when in terms of this sort of thing. So I would have added that at the end and saying, by the way, here's another piece. Your big piece is really what you brought up second. And that is the effect of the investments, both, both uh, prior and in, or both internationally and domestically. JP Morgan is a major player financially, as we know. JP Morgan, along with some of their other Wall Street colleagues, can, can literally change the world because they have the money, they have the influence. And you're talking about the idea that these folks uh, can do this is very valuable. They have the power. And if you ever met anybody in investment banking, they know they have the power. And so I, I would have gone there. I, I really I really like what you said about what happens when you when you invest in fossil fuels, what happens when you invest in renewable energy. I like the fact that you said greenwashing is a term that's becoming a little bit arcane right now. Uh, it's going to need to be replaced by other things in the future. But to, to bring up the idea and to, and to buttress it with just a couple of statistics in there, I think was was um, very, very valuable. And, and really, really enjoyed that. I think that, that um, Felicia, I think that, that you, you, you made a good attempt to make eye contact with us by looking over at the camera a fair, a fair amount. 
and that was very effective. I also like the fact that you you do have you do show some friendliness, you show some you show some enthusiasm. There were parts that I that I thought were were a little bit pre-designed and pre-memorized, sounding more like written English than than spoken English. But you went back and forth on it. So I think you know what it's gonna what it's gonna be like going forward for you to just hone those skills just a little bit. And uh, Madeline, unfortunately, you really didn't make much eye contact. You really weren't you weren't uh, you weren't looking at us very much. And so it became obvious that that the way you were looking down, you were reading off of, off of your notes. And so again, you, you do have a have a pleasant way of presenting, and you make your audience want to listen to you. It's a matter of just honing things a little bit and and becoming more friendly and more engaging with your audience. And if you do that, it will go a long ways for you because your content was good. Now let's move on to Holy Cross. Such an interesting, again, just such an interesting topic and, and taking this whole idea of screen addiction and expanding on it, I think was a really smart move we are all pretty well aware of, of this whole idea of people spending way too much time on social media, of playing way too much time, playing video games. You added something to that argument, which I really appreciated. And that is you showed an especially bad area that I don't know that people really are, are, are aware of. And I think your research probably showed, so I certainly wasn't aware of the issues with underage gambling. And I, and I, I would guess that parents don't necessarily fully know too. And so I liked your piece about, about engaging parents and making them aware of what happens because the kids aren't going to tell them that they're gambling. They're going to need to find out from you as consultants or whatever the, the, the issue you, you uh, in research you decide to cite. I think it's going to be, it's going to be extremely valuable. And I really liked the fact that you addressed something that was in my head. And that is well, so what? This is a sweepstakes. This is this is fake coins. This is this is not real gambling. Well, as you so deftly pointed out, just because they're not pulling coins out of the slot machine doesn't mean it's not gambling. And, and that they're being set up, whether or not there's actual money happening or prizes or what it is, they're being set up for a gambling addiction. And so in, in fact, it is an addiction. And I thought that was really smart to, to bring that out. And uh, I like I like the fact that, that you talked about educating educating the consumer more work again again working with the parents. I like the idea of um, kids don't necessarily understand the value of money, so they're learning the wrong sort of thing. Let's see, I, I, I um, yeah, I, I like the idea of, of the skid system identity fraud those sorts of things it's, it's never that's never 100 percent effective but even if it's 50 percent effective it's certainly better than nothing and so especially now in this day that we're moving forward with identity recognition much much faster than ever before i think there'll be more growth in that area and, I, and i'm glad you brought that up okay oh and another another issue is that it brings up the question of legality versus what is right. And oftentimes that is a core ethical argument. Yes, it is true that, that they circumvented the legal system to come up with something that was legal. That doesn't make it right. And as you pointed out, you're still setting them up for the exact same problems, even though what you're doing is in fact legal. I really, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, Ilian, when, uh, Ilian, when you when you were reading, you really looked bored. I really, I really was not drawn in to listen to you because you were talking in a monotone voice. You weren't smiling. You weren't you weren't showing uh, a lot of interest, and you were obviously reading reading from something because you were looking down. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna suggest to you going forward. You may have to manufacture some interest. You may have to manufacture some friendliness, and that's okay. I can't expect you to be all excited and gaga over everything that you report on in your career, 
But just understand that the enthusiasm piece goes a huge, long, long way in, in connecting with your audience. So just bring some of your personality. I'm sure, I'm sure that you're that you're a very good person. I tend to like to call it the first date personality, where you're really putting your best foot forward and you're, and you're trying to sound interested and looking interested. So keep that uh, keep that in mind because you have a lot of other good skills. Anthony, I thought I thought that uh, you were you were better at, at looking at the screen, so you didn't come across sounding as as much as you were reading. It, it did sound a little bit more original. Again, I think it, I think you would build more trust in in, in your your uh, perceived leadership potential. Your perceived credibility will be helped by your bringing more personality in. Sometimes people think that, especially in business in business schools, that if you show if you show any sort of emotion at all, well, that's not business. Business is straightforward. It is it is dollars and cents, and Ah, uh, yeah, some of it that that way is, but humans are still humans, and so we react personally to people as much as as much as data. I like the way you buttressed your argument just a tiny little bit, talking about the percentage of youth that that uh, are facing addiction through this four to eight percent versus one percent. As Murray said, we're not looking for a lot of of data here. But a little bit helps when you're when you're dealing with an audience of executives, higher up people. People tend to go to look for at least a couple of the numbers just to show that you have done your research. And so I found that those numbers to be extremely helpful and shocking at the same time, which I I, I might have actually put that up at the top as part of the introduction, because that's a real grabbing line. And I don't think that people. Uh, really understand the gravity of this problem, which is huge. So overall, I really, I really enjoyed your presentation. I think that it was a good topic to choose from, and you brought up some very salient points that uh, that were very helpful. So thank you. Talking, talking to Stetson now, um, this was also, also an interesting topic because it's something that we all know just intuitively exists. And we've all heard the stories and we know that there are some companies out there, they have rules about this, some don't. We also know that I can't remember the percentage of uh, long-term relationships that actually start in the office and continue on. It's this sort of stuff is known, but to have it broken down into such a way like this, I thought was very, very valuable. And I would, I would, uh, and, and I like the idea. Of, you, you listed some of the some of the negative results, the favoritism, the distrust. Interesting piece that I might have expanded on is you talked about all stakeholders. And when you say that, when you say all stakeholders to an executive board, their ears definitely prick up because they, they want to know how things affect not only them, but what about the greater good here? What about the greater thing out here? And so, and so when you started to talk about all stakeholders, you might have gone out there and, and grabbed a couple more stakeholders and given examples of how this would affect them and, and how it affects them negatively, how it could affect them positively. And and there are obviously a lot of stakeholders and people when people are likely to say, oh, hadn't thought about that when you're talking about stakeholders. I also in, in agreement with Murray, I even whether or not that this company has an international presence doesn't really matter because there's an assumption that, that all business is international now. Everything's global. And who knows, this company may have may have uh, ideas to expand globally more or whatever. And I, and I think that there are answers to be found to this question in other countries. Maybe. I don't, I, I shouldn't say I know that. Maybe there's a possibility that the way it's handled in Japan is a little bit, maybe it works better, or maybe in, in middle, uh, in the Mediterranean or in Northern Africa. So I think I might've brought in some, some, some examples internationally. That tends to get an audience excited as well these days, because you say international, oh yeah, every, everything's international now. But certainly, 
certainly an interesting, uh, and, and I thought that uh, I was also very, very uh, shocked by the statistic, 58% have had an office romance of some length. Um, 72% have a have, uh, willingness to do this again. Yeah, again, just a little bit of statistics, which is what you did, just a little is a good idea because it shows that you've done, that you've done your research. And I agree with Murray, don't, don't overdo it in, when you're doing an, uh, this type of a presentation, save all the dollars and cents and all that stuff for a more financial-based presentation. But I think just a little is, is a really good idea. Now, um, Jackson, you you had uh, you had some good eye contact with, it, and I really enjoyed seeing that. I think that your enthusiasm was was very good. There may be more more to uh, more opportunity to bring forward forward your personality. Something tells me you have a great personality, you're kind of a partier, and people like you. I think that you could uh, bring that and use that to your advantage a little bit uh, a little bit more out there. But I really appreciate it because I did feel like you were talking to me, Cole. You're on the road. You're on the road to having better eye contact and, and sounding more natural. So whatever it is you're doing to get there, I just would just uh, encourage you to continue and continue getting better with that. I think you have I think you have a good start with that. And those are those are the notes that I had for Stetson. Again, very interesting topic that you chose. Unusual. When I first saw it, when I first got the list of topics, I thought. I don't think we've ever seen that one at IBEC before. So certainly very interesting from, from that standpoint. Potsdam, SUNY, another, another, good, uh, another good piece and certainly very, a very good choice for right now. There's so much going on in the education industry, and it's pretty well known that people are very much suffering from debt, student debt that doesn't necessarily line up with the value of the education that they got. And the fact that the average now in undergrad length of tenure is five years, used to be just a little over four, now the average is five years. That says something right there. Why are students, why are young people taking so long to get through college? Very, very interesting. And for, for that reason, I think it is important that, that we talk about other options in life. I, I myself, as was brought up, it was never even a thought that my siblings and I wouldn't go to college. Never. Nobody ever said, oh, let's look at your options. There were no options, at least in my family. You, uh, you, 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 you went to college. Well, there are other opportunities out there, and I think it was very important to, to bring that up. I might have added in a little bit more about what are some of these opportunities and maybe put in just a little bit of data, a little shocking statistic on what people that don't necessarily go to college can achieve. Now, there's the obvious cases. You've got Bill, uh, Bill Gates, who dropped out of Harvard. You have a couple of people with high school educations. Even though, I mean, those are the famous ones, but you could pick up a lot of others and, and show that as well. Because without that, without that backing it up, me as a Board of Education member, I, I just need more to convince me. I would think that if you're going to be on a Board of Education, you're going to be favoring education. And so you may need just a little bit more of uh, incentive to say, yeah, what you do is really good, but it's just not everything. So you might want to take a look at that. Zion, I really, I really enjoyed that you brought in a personal story at the beginning. Audiences, or excuse me, adults love stories. As kids, we loved stories. As adults, we love stories. And if you can toss in stories about yourself or about somebody you know, or really about anything, we respond to stories much better than bland, straightforward information. So I think that was a great idea that, that, uh, that you did that. I would work on your eye contact, Zion. You were pretty much looking down and reading the entire time, which took away from your perceived interest in your own topic, although you did vary your voice and you weren't too monotone. Just a little bit to, to add. Macy, you had really nice eye contact that was very, very much appreciated. 
it made a difference. And so I hope that you will continue that. You did seem more interested in, in, in your topic than some, some folks did across the four schools. And so I, you, you did make me want to listen to you. I really liked your point, Macy, about at the age of 18, brains are not well developed. This is somewhat, this is, this is research that is being refined out there right now. It's been known for some time, but it's being refined to the point where, oh, okay. Okay, this, this is showing up more and more. So this idea that at 18, how can you be trusted to make that choice on your own or even evaluate it on your own? Very valuable, very, very good point. I like you're talking about gap years. It is looked down upon now, but that's because old people like me are still in charge. Once, once your day comes and us old folks are in diapers in the nursing home and you're controlling the world, I would make the prediction that gap years will become much more accepted and maybe even promoted. So I think you're, you're on the cutting edge in talking about that. Tanner, your, your eye contact was almost non-existent. I found myself thinking, does he even know there's a camera in the room? Because you were looking off to the side, you were looking down, probably reading. So I would, I would just uh, keep, keep working on it. You've got a lot of good skills to build upon. So just keep working on it, becoming more comfortable and try to communicate with your audience rather than broadcast information. That's what I have and that's what Murray has. And we hope that this was valuable for you going forward. I like to look at it from the standpoint of that you're going to be making presentations throughout your life. And so the, the comments that I give you, I just hope you'll think about going forward because I taught this for a lot of years. I worked at a lot of executives and I do know what they're looking for. So, so trust me, if you keep working on your presentation skills, it will only, it will only help you out. And Jim, can I make a couple of additional comments building on what you've said just for very quickly? Of course. Absolutely. So, so, I mean, again, all credit to all of the participants. Um, I found that, you know, presenting and presenting by a video are two slightly different things. And the more you get an opportunity to watch yourself on video, to reiterate and tweak some things, do it again, do it again, you get better every single iteration on that. So uh, please don't be discouraged to anybody. I mean, all credit to everybody involved here. Um, this is kind of an exercise. I know it's a competition, but it's kind of a learning exercise. And, and you know, I'd love to, for, you know, Jim and I to, to be able to give you some things that really are of value to you and help you in the future next time you have to do anything personally or professionally, uh, where you can take some of the, the learnings um, from this. I thought Jim's point about storytelling was enormously powerful. I mean, there's something deep in the human brain about this that, you know, talking numbers, talking statistics, it's a big turn off. Uh, and, you know, it's tough within 10 minutes, but if you find, you know, a human example, uh, one person, the effect this issue has had on them or what happened to them, um, connect with the human element, connect with the emotions, it gets your audience uh, and it will add so much to your overall uh, takeaway for, 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 for the, the, the audience. Um, I was just going to say also, finally, I mentioned at the beginning uh, what I call CTA, call to action. This is really, really important. And some teams were stronger on this than others. Um, you really want to focus clearly in any form of communication, especially a presentation like this. What is my call to action? You need to be absolutely crystal clear as a team on what is your call to action? What are you asking the audience to do? Sorry, I'm trying to get run over. Um, what are you asking the audience to do? when they've listened to your presentation. You know, please click here, please sign this contract, please change this, please do this. And in general for that kind of less is more. And then final thing for me would be uh, the power of three. So again, the human brain remembers things in threes, the holy trinity or whatever other example you wanna think of, right? So if you distill your kind of um, actions and takeaway here, into three specific things, um, then that makes it much more powerful. So, you know, our three key messages for you today, why not say this at the beginning of the presentation and re repeat it at the end, are one, start doing this, two, stop doing that, and three, change the other thing. I promise you there's a much greater chance if you do that, that your audience will remember it, will take it away, and will act on it. 
Thank you very much. Thanks, Murray. Does anyone have any questions at all about today? Again, just because we gave you a lot of feedback, it's not meant to be negative feedback. It's meant it's meant to be uh, uh, helpful for for you in your future. I have one question for Please. you, Mr. Arnold, or any judge. So, like, this is for all of us because you did mention that we all need to like improve our presenting skills with like energy and enthusiasm. So, like, what is a good way to practice that or to like actually develop that skill? Because like when we're just talking, it seems like we're putting in enthusiasm and energy but what is like a good way to like speak faster when you need to slow down when you need to or like just oh can you elaborate on that well there, yeah there's two pieces to that number one as we're going to say as we would say over and over it's a matter of practice but another way is to have somebody listen to your presentation somebody that knows you and just present to them for a little while a few minutes and say, does this really sound like me? Does this sound like the Jackson that you know as your, as your friend? And have them comment on that and point out to you, yes, it does, no, it doesn't. Because really, the more you're just yourself is, is the, 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 uh, the goal right there. More to be more like your, the person that you normally are. If you're, if you're a person that, that is a bit more serious, I don't think that it's worth your time to try and become a, a super, super enthusiastic person if it doesn't match who you are. So just, just try to think, as I'm doing this, do I sound like, do I look like when I'm talking to a friend of mine? Because that's really all you need to worry about doing. So I, I, the underscore Jackson would be, would be just, keep, just keep working on it. You'll get it. Thank, Thank you. you. That's Thank an you. excellent, excellent question. Thank you. Anybody else? I have a question. Oh, okay. Um, my, oh, I think I'm just just hearing some. some uh, my question here. was. I don't. Um, um, my question was: Do you feel that body language? Came. You're breaking up, Zion. Oh, I'm sorry. My question was: do, do you feel that body language has equal value virtually than it would like in person? That's a great question. And I tend to make all my comments to be uh, based on research because I am an ac ac academic in a previous career. The research is still a little bit out on that one, but the general feeling is, yes, it does play an important role in Zoom, but it, what, because of the limitations of your body language, the fact that people are more than likely to only be seeing your shoulders and your head, it's a little bit harder to bring that in. So what, what it really comes back down to, your body language becomes the level of enthusiasm and friendliness that, that you bring in. And certainly the eye contact is a definite body, body language piece. It communicates a lot about you. So continue to work on that for your Zoom presentations and, and just know that you are a little bit limited in, in what you do compared to if you were making a live presentation. Thank you, really good question. Anybody else? You've been just, you've been great to work with today. I know this takes a while to go through everything, but uh, uh, really, really appreciate all the time that you put into this. You are now two thirds of the way done through IBEC and you will have your 90 second presentation coming up later. So I wish you all the best and uh, I think if you take a few of these things and bring them with you, I think it, I, I think it may help you. And we certainly, we certainly wish you well going forward. Mary, closing comments. Have a fantastic weekend, everybody. Yes, thank you very much. I have to run to another uh, Zoom presentation.